Uh, my speaker today uh, uh, is uh, Dr. Ellen Rennick. Uh, uh, studied uh, uh, for BA at Oxford for MA at CU, uh, uh, then uh, for a PhD in Turkey. Returned to Oxford uh, and afterwards he did uh, uh, a long postdoctoral research uh, uh, project uh, at New College uh, in the context of which he analyzed uh, the process of electoral reform in those four countries which changed from major at hand to proportional uh, representation ever, and we established not just for the other way around, so before instances really uh, take major electoral reforms in established democracies, uh, undertook extensive uh, field uh, research in Japan, New Zealand, France, and Italy, four countries concerned, and uh, this became the basis of his uh, kitchen with the press book, uh, which is politics of electoral reform, changing the uh, rules of democracy, which is a very, uh, uh, well, well recognized book by now, and in literature was uh, something which uh, gave a fresh uh, uh, look at uh, these issues in terms of processes and uh, uh, norms uh, uh, that, that regulate uh, this process. Uh, uh, after this project, he kept on working on various uh, uh, aspects of electoral reform, including electoral reforms in the UK, where uh, uh, as a side project, he wrote a very entertaining and incredibly informative uh, little uh, um, popular science book, uh, let's put it this way, A Citizen's Guide to Electoral Reform, which uh, I highly recommend to your attention uh, uh, as, as, a, as, a as a fundamental introduction in the topic of uh, electoral systems, served as uh, the chief specialist expert uh, 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 for the BBC in the context of uh, last year's uh, referendum on electoral reform in the UK, uh, give advice to the House of Lords on how they should or should not inform themselves, and uh, also performs his role at the University of Reading as a leader in conversion politics and I for uh, research <coughs> in politics. His uh, uh, area of specialization mainly is applied political theory and uh, uh, Organizations called Cooperative Politics. His current uh, research uh, projects look at the process of electoral reform in uh, Europe, uh, and as well as a, a separate project on the uh, discord, popular discord, political discourse around electoral reform in the UK since 1945. Uh, Alan is a very competent speaker for Hungarian, as many of you may know. Um, Alan was. Anyway. Oh, was. <laughs> uh, um, the improvements in your Czech and Estonian probably diminished. Well, anyway, uh, uh, he, uh, he claims not to be a specialist on Hungary, uh, but he's going to help us to understand that the Hungary is uh, in a comparative perspective, of course, on the basis of his own uh, research based on common resources. Uh, and, uh, our discussant will be. Uh, Laszlo Robert, who is an economist and political scientist uh, uh, with his degrees at the uh, uh, of Economic Sciences, later renamed as Corvus uh, uh, University, and you still studied at Corvus University. He is, um, I think, uh, 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 you shouldn't listen now, uh, 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 because you may, he's too modest to, to hear this, but he is the leading specialist expert on electoral systems and electoral reform in, in Hungary. He is leading uh, the electoral system reform project of uh, the Poland Capital Institute in the world since the 90s, and he teaches uh, 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 related specialization at the uh, Corpus University. So he's going to give a uh, response from a specifically Hungarian specialist perspective to the cooperative uh, talk. And I'm very glad uh, to have you both here. And Thank you, everyone. It's wonderful to be back here. Um, as Gabor mentioned, I was a student here at CEU uh, in the 1990s for two very happy years. Um, so it's great to return. Um, as that introduction has suggested, I've been doing 
many diverse things that have taken me away from Hungary in the study of Hungarian politics over the last few years. Uh, I haven't been back in Hungary, in fact, for six years, uh, which is far too long, so it's wonderful to return. Um, Gabor emphasized that I do not claim, if ever I could uh, anymore, to be an expert in Hungarian politics. Um, I'm a comparativist who happens to have um, an unusual degree of curiosity about the things that happen uh, in Hungary. Um, and it's that perspective that I will be uh, adopting in the talk today. Um, just remembered I have to put the slides back on. Sorry, I had them off because I was sitting in front of the projector, um, which was a little unpleasant. Um, so the comparative question that uh, drives a lot of my research at the moment looks at um, the degree to which it is true that electoral systems are controlled by politicians pursuing their own self-interest, or to what degree rather it is possible for um, other influences, for um, uh, notions of the public good to have an influence over electoral reform processes. Uh, this seems to me a pretty important question. The electoral system is at the heart of democracy. Um, and if it is the case, as traditionally it has tended to be argued that it is the case, that politicians completely control the electoral system and that those politicians, the politicians in power, simply uh, manipulate the electoral system in order to pursue their own power interests, then we have a problem, a fundamental problem in the democratic system. Um, on the other hand, um, there are at least some indications, and my, my work that uh, Gabor was talking about there uh, has, has referred to this, that suggest that um, there may be other sorts of influence uh, that can come into play in electoral reform processes. It's not necessarily the case that it's always the politicians who dominate. It is sometimes the case that um, popular pressure can push politicians into accepting electoral reforms that they wouldn't otherwise want to adopt. Um, it is sometimes the case that the courts get involved uh, in electoral reform processes. And it's sometimes the case, even when the politicians are basically in control, that they're subject to constraints, normative constraints, constraints of what's legitimate, what they can get away with, basically. Uh, that limit the, the, the degree to which they are able to pursue their self-interest. So understanding the ways in which these kinds of factors can come into play uh, in electoral reform processes is what um, is interesting me at the moment in quite a lot of the work that I'm doing, which leads to a number of questions uh, relating particularly to the Hungarian electoral reform uh, that I'll try to tackle today. So uh, I'm referring here, of course, to the reform of the Hungarian electoral system passed just before Christmas at the end of last year. Um, first question about that is, um, did this reform in fact promote the public interest or did it uh, serve uh, the um, uh, interests of those in power? Second question, uh, how does this reform compare to other reforms enacted elsewhere? Um, if, as I think is going to be likely, I conclude that this was very largely a self-interest based electoral reform, is this unusual? Um, or is this the sort of thing that we see uh, in other countries as well? And then thirdly, if again it is the case that this is essentially a self-interested reform, um, what are the circumstances that might make things different? What are the circumstances in which we might rather have a greater role for um, uh, public opinion or for notions of the public good to have a role in processes of electoral reform? How could things be different uh, in, in Hungary? Um, before we get on to those questions, however, it is necessary to uh, say a little bit of, uh, about what actually happened in this electoral reform. This will be very familiar territory for some of you and perhaps less familiar territory for others. So, as is very well known, the, Hung the um, old Hungarian electoral system was famously one of the most complicated electoral systems in the world. In the first place, it was a mixed electoral system. So it combined uh, some members of parliament who were elected in single member districts on majoritarian lines, and others who were uh, elected using uh, uh, proportional mechanisms from party lists. Voters had two votes, 
uh, for a candidate in a single member district and also for a party list. Those lists were closed, which so voters weren't able to change the order of candidates uh, on the list, but nevertheless, uh, voters had uh, two votes. Um, in addition to that, however, there were three particular features of the Hungarian system, the old system, that made it complex, even when compared to other mixed uh, electoral systems. The first is that um, in the, uh, the single-member district part of the electoral system, um, the electoral formula used was a two-round uh, formula, so there were two rounds of voting, a majoritarian system uh, for uh, deciding the outcome of the election, rather than a simple single round plurality system. Um, and in this respect, uh, Hungary was almost unique among uh, countries using uh, mixed systems. Lithuania, I think, is the only other case using a two round system in conjunction with a mixed system. Um, secondly, the proportional part of the electoral system was divided into two parts. So there were uh, two tiers of allocation of uh, seats from the party lists at the county level and at the national level. Um, and I think uh, the Hungarian mixed system was unique in this regard. All other mixed systems have only one tier of allocation in the proportional part. And then thirdly, um, whereas most uh, mixed systems are either purely compensatory systems <coughs> in the sense that uh, the seats are allocated in order to produce an overall outcome across all of the seats in Parliament that is proportional to the votes cast, so you uh, allocate the seats from party lists in order to compensate for the disproportionalities in the districts. And that's the sort of system that is operated in New Zealand, in Germany, for example. Or mixed systems are parallel systems in which the two parts are simply operated independently of each other. So you have the results in the districts, you have the results in the proportional component, and there's simply no connection uh, between these in working out the outcome. Um, and Japan, for example, uses such a system. Hungary, by contrast, managed to have both. Um, so for the, uh, uh, the county level, uh, um, the, the allocation was entirely parallel, um, while for the national level, there was a compensatory element uh, in, in how uh, the seats were allocated. So, uh, an exceptionally complicated electoral system. The reform uh, changed the system in a number of ways. Firstly, um, can you see this, by the way? It's not very easy to see the screen, is it? <coughs> this is going to cause problems later on, but for now, it's not terribly important. I'll tell you what's on here. Um, so firstly, the size of the legislature is cut dramatically from 608, uh, sorry, 386 seats to 199. This is the biggest cut in the size of a legislature, a, a, a national lower house, that has been seen in U Europe, in democratic Europe, since at least 1945. And there are some big cuts during transition from communism in some countries, but there's, in, in an ongoing democratic context, this is the biggest cut in the size of any uh, legislature. Um, the system retains a number of features of the old system, so it's still a s mixed system. It's still a system with partial compensation for disproportionalities in the district tier. Um, and voters still have two votes, uh, lists remain closed. So all of these things remain the same. Um, the system is simplified in a couple of ways. Firstly, in the single member district part of the electoral system. Gabor, can you see anything from there? Are we okay? Okay. <laughs> it's going to get smaller later on. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so in the single member district part of the system, uh, the, the, the elections are changed from the two round system to the one round system, so that is a, a simplification. Um, and in the proportional part, uh, one of the tiers is eliminated. So you, could, you remove the, the county tier of allocation and there's simply one national tier of allocation. In addition, um, the balance between the different parts of the system is changed a bit. So. Um, the balance now moves in favour of the single member districts, which are the majority of seats now, whereas previously they were uh, slightly in the minority. And in addition, the rules um, for, count for which votes count um, in, in the compensatory part of the, the proportional uh, tier also change. Um, I will 
go into the exciting detail of this point in a little bit, um, but uh, that, that part uh, also changes and is quite important. <clears throat> Overall, um, there are um, the following changes that seem to me to be the principal changes. Firstly, as I've said, uh, the uh, total size of the assembly is reduced quite dramatically. Secondly, there are a number of changes that make the system overall mo more majoritarian in character. I'll talk a bit about what those are in a moment. Thirdly, um, the districts, the, the boundaries of the districts are changed, ne necessarily, because the number of districts is cut from 176 to 106. Um, so they have to redraw the boundaries and the processes uh, by which that has been done are very interesting. Um, in addition, uh, as many of you will know, there is the uh, extension of the franchise to Hungarians living abroad. And furthermore, this is only the first part of the electoral reform process. We still await the uh, new law on electoral procedure, uh, which, as I'm aware, is going to be introduced to Parliament next month. Um, so we don't have that yet. So there's more joy yet to come on this front. <coughs> um, now, um, I'll talk only about the first three. Obviously, I can't talk about the law and electoral procedure because we don't have it yet. Um, and I won't talk about the franchise extension either. That is a bit outside my uh, area of expertise. So I'll be focusing in on the first three of those areas. And the question to think about then is what underlies these um, and to what degree do they serve some notion of the public interest or rather uh, the private interests of Fides, Fides politicians, Fides leaders, whoever it might be. So let us start um, with the reduction in the number of deputies uh, from 386 to 199. Well, at first glance, this would seem to be a pretty good candidate for a reform that fits the public uh, agenda, that serves the public good. Um, public opinion in Hungary has long been said to favour a cut in the number of politicians. Um, such a cut would certainly um, appeal to anti-politician sentiments and could be argued to reduce the costs of politics, this kind of thing. <clears throat> in addition, Hungary's parliament was abnormally large before the reform, uh, given uh, the population of Hungary. Um, some, po some political scientists, Rein, uh, Rein Tagapra and Matthew Soberg Schugert, um, uh, identified something called the cube root law of assembly size in the 1980s, according to which, generally speaking, a, a country's assembly, na national assembly, uh, the number of members of that is roughly equal to the cube root of the population of that country. Don't you love it? Um, and this uh, seems to be pretty accurate on the whole, if you look around the world. So this is a scatter plot of um, all European democracies, um, established democracies at least, consolidated democracies, plus various other countries around the world that are established democracies. Um, the blue line up here is the line at which uh, the number of members in the lower house of parliament is equal to the cube, cube root of the population. Um, and you can see that the line of best fit among all of these cases is pretty close to that, and most countries do in, indeed follow the pattern quite closely. Hungary um, was an outlier, however. This was Hungary pre-reform, the red dot here, way above the line. Um, uh, the, Hungary's population is about 10 million. The cube root of 10 million is 215. Um, so according to this law, uh, par uh, parliament in Hungary should have had about 215 members, not 386. Clearly 199 is very close to 215. So it, would seem that Hungary now conforms very nicely with this law. Um, and Matthew Soberg Schugart, one of those uh, political scientists who came up with this law, um, said in 1989 that it would be a good development if Hungary were to cut the size of its legislature and uh, move down onto the uh, x equals y line on that graph. So uh, there seem to be lots of good reasons for thinking that um, uh, this change does uh, 
serve some notion of the public good. It strikes me, however, that we need to be um, a bit careful of that argument. And firstly, this cube root law is only an empirical observation about what is the case in the wor world. Um, there's no sort of normative notion that countries should have assemblies the size of the cube root of their population. And Shugart has uh, c committed one of those little fallacies of political science in saying it would be a good thing for Hungary to, to move down onto the line in, in assuming that, oh, look, I found this generalization and thinking that means this is the way it should be. Um, and why should a country have an assembly the size of which is the cube root of the population of that country? There are actually some pretty good reasons for thinking that larger assemblies may be desirable. Um, take the UK, for example. The UK is this country here, largest democratically elected lower house in the world. Um, 650 members at the moment, way above the line. Um, now, the UK, um, at the next election, if all goes to plan, will have a lower house with only 600 members, because a law was passed last year affecting this change. Um, so we'll go just below Italy. Um, we'll still be pretty high up, but just below Italy. Um, this was opposed by many, many people, not just politicians, but also many commentators and many political scientists, partly on the grounds that MPs in the UK do a great deal of work in their constituencies for individual <coughs> constituents. Um, and if there are fewer MPs, then there are more constituents per MP, and it becomes harder for MPs to perform this function. And it was also opposed widely um, because a smaller chamber can harm the ability in a parliamentary system can harm the ability of the legislature to hold the executive to account. Uh, essentially, unless the executive also shrinks while the legislature shrinks, then the executive becomes a bigger part of the legislature, um, which makes it easier for the, for the executive to control the legislature. Now, of course, if, as may be the case in Hungary at the moment, party discipline is so high that it doesn't actually matter um, what the size of the executive is within the legislature, then, then perhaps this isn't a significant uh, consideration. But um, uh, at least if um, party discipline isn't at that sort of level, then, then this is a significant consideration. Um, and particularly in a smaller chamber, once you get down below the sorts of levels that we're talking about in the UK to the sorts of levels that we're talking about in Hungary. Um, and if the electoral system is strongly disproportional, then reducing the size of the legislature reduces uh, to very small numbers, or can reduce to very small numbers, the number of representatives from opposition parties. Um, so it can become very difficult, particularly for smaller opposition parties, to um, uh, meaningfully operate in the legislature. And it can be difficult even for the largest opposition party. And the MSP at the moment in Hungary has 59 seats, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the uh, simulations from Hoza Ish Holodash uh, say that under the new rules, uh, the MSP would have 21 seats. I know there is some debate about the validity of the Hoza Ish Holodash figures. Um, but uh, nevertheless, this is a pretty good uh, ballpark estimate, I presume. Um, the largest opposition party with 21 members, would it really be able to prepare effectively for government um, <coughs> if it had such a small legislative representation? And that means that in actual fact, for a number of reasons, a small, legis a small legislative chamber may serve the interests of those in power rather than any notion of the public interest. Um, when we're thinking about the interests of those in power, we could be thinking about a variety of different things. We could be thinking about the interests of party leaders. We could be thinking about the interests of um, politicians as a whole. Um, and when we think about a cut in the number of MPs from 386 to 199, one view would be that's a really bizarre thing for Parliament to decide to do. Almost half of the MPs are deciding to vote themselves out of a job. Um, and why would they do that? But given the exceptionally high level of party discipline on this, and there wasn't a single Fidesz vote against uh, this new electoral law, um, that would seem to suggest that actually it's not the interests of uh, the individual backbench, ordinary rank-and-file politicians um, that are shaping this, but rather it's the interests of the political leaders. 
If anyone, by the way, knows how they managed to get every MP to vote for uh, a reform that would uh, cause many of them to lose their jobs, I'd be very interested to know. Um, so, um, we're, we're looking here at the power of, of, of party leaders rather than the rank and file. Um, and as I've suggested, uh, if a smaller legislature uh, weakens the opposition, particularly if it weakens the smaller parties, um, then that would seem to be to the advantage of Fidesz leaders. Um, so through this reform, it's pretty good actually for Fidesz, they can appear to be responding to public opinion. They can say, hey, look, all these politicians for 20 years have been denying you, despite all the rhetoric, um, a, a cut in the bloated parliament. But we have done it. We have acted on your side. Whereas in actual fact, what they're doing is instituting a reform that consolidates the power of the government. Um, so, okay, that's um, the assembly size reduction. What then about um, our second uh, principal change? change uh, changes in a majoritarian, electoral, uh, majoritarian direction. So a majoritarian system is one that tends to lead to victory for uh, single parties. Uh, so so uh, tends to allow single parties to win a majority in the legislature. Um, and this can be promoted in a number of ways. It can be promoted by harming small parties, by making it harder for small parties to win seats. It can also be done by increasing the bonus for the largest party relative to the second largest party in terms of the number of seats that it wins. And a number of aspects of the reform uh, increase the majoritarianism of the system. One is the reduction in the assembly size, as I've already uh, discussed, uh, makes it harder for smaller parties to uh, win seats. In addition to that, um, the um, shift in the system used within the single member districts from um, a two round system to a one round system, again, makes life harder for smaller parties. If you've got a two round system, then the first round can be a bit like a primary. So you've got a primary on the left and a primary on the right. The various parties of the left can squabble among each other, work, work out who's top, um, similarly on the right, and then the, the, the single candidates can go through to the second round. Um, so it's easier for small parties to survive in a two-round system than it is in a one-round system where all, all of that coordination has to happen before any election takes place. Um, in addition, the uh, increase in the proportion of uh, all the seats that are um, allocated in single member districts uh, pushes the system in a majoritarian direction. Um, if the system were fully compensatory, this wouldn't matter. I mean, in New Zealand, for example, 58% of the seats at the last election were elected in single member districts, but nevertheless, the overall result was proportional. Um, because there was enough of a compensatory element still to compensate for the disproportionalities. Um, given, however, that Hungary doesn't have a fully proportional, uh, comp sorry, fully compensatory system, and given that um, at least at some elections uh, one party almost sweeps the board in the single member districts, um, this, this is significant. This does make a difference. And then finally, we have the joy of the changed rules for transferring votes to the upper tier of the system. Um, so it used to be the case that only the votes of losing candidates were transferred from the single member districts um, to be counted um, when allocating the uh, seats from the national list. Now it is the case that you transfer those votes, but you also transfer the votes that the winning candidate didn't need in order to win. So you transfer the difference between the winning candidate's vote and the second place candidate's vote, um, which means that lots and lots of votes are being transferred from candidates that have already won uh, a seat and are being counted uh, in the national tier. And again, that um, improves the position of the party that has already done well in the single, single member districts, i.e. the largest party. So um, we have these various changes, and the overall effect of these changes, according to the simulations, is that at least when there's one party that is significantly ahead, um, it can expect to receive a larger bonus in terms of seats 
uh, than under the old rules. Um, let me emphasize that I'm not a Hungarian politics specialist, so I have not done simulations myself. Um, but uh, this is what I read in the simulations that I have seen. So can this be defended in terms of the public interest? Well, certainly the shift to plurality uh, in the single member districts makes the system more simple and reduces the costs of elections. Um, these seem to me to be perfectly valid arguments. How important arguments those are might be questioned. Um, and democracy ought to cost something. It's important. Um, and if uh, a system that is more, uh, more democratic costs a bit more, then um, uh, to some extent, that should be fine. Um, uh, so, so it's not entirely clear to me that we should be all that concerned about this point, but nevertheless, it is a factor that might be taken into account. Regarding the change in vote transfer rules, so this thing that unnecessary votes for winning candidates get transferred, Fides justifies this on the basis that it means that no vote is wasted. Every vote counts. Um, this seems to me a delightful piece of theoretical sophistry. Um, I, I, clearly, it is desirable that everyone's vote should count equally. Um, but voters don't really think terribly much, most of them, about how their vote is going through the process of being counted through all of these various different bits and pieces. Voters, if they think about the election at all, think about the outcome of the election. And the effect of this change on the outcome as a whole is to increase existing disproportionalities, i.e. to increase um, differences in the weight of different votes cast for different parties. So if you look at what actually matters, um, then this change actually increases dis disparities between votes. It doesn't reduce those disparities. So that argument seems to me to be quite specious. Um, Fides also argues... Um, that um, uh, it's important to get the balance between proportionality and governability right in, in the electoral system. Um, uh, Erika Sobo uh, said in Parliament during the debate uh, on the law in December that the question of proportionality and governability, governability is a key question for every electoral system. In considering it, we must recognize that each of these values can be realized only at the expense of the other, etc., etc. I believe that the bill offers an appropriate solution to this. Um, so, clearly she's right that uh, governability and proportionality both matter. Um, and she's absolutely right also that consider considerations of governability can be used to justify a majoritarian electoral system. Many countries have over um, uh, many years preferred such uh, systems. The, is the issue is that Hungary hasn't had a problem with governability <laughs> arising from the electoral system. Um, uh, there has been no problem in forming governments after elections in Hungary. There has been no problem with um, uh, uh, governments collapsing as a result of uh, issues uh, in the election results. Uh, every parliament in Hungary has lasted its full course. So uh, while it is fine to defend on this basis a majoritarian electoral system, um, there's no justification here for increasing the disproportionality of the electoral system. Hungary's electoral system is already one of the most disproportional uh, in uh, established democracies. So this takes lots and lots of countries uh, that are all established democracies and um, it looks at there are many indices, ways of measuring disproportionality. This is one of them. Um, and you can see that uh, Hungary is up here at one of the highest levels of disproportionality. Um, highest level of disproportionality of any of the former communist countries. Um, it's comparable level of disproportionality to what is found in a number of countries using pure single member district electoral systems, such as New Zealand before 1993, Canada, and the UK. Um, now, as I've suggested, um, there isn't a problem with democracy, I would say, um, in countries that are even further in this direction than Hungary is. So that Hungary is up here isn't a problem. 
Um, but why is it necessary to move Hungary further in that direction? That, the, a justification for that hasn't been given. Um, by contrast, if we look at the impact of this change on Fidesz's interests, um, the change has been made a long way ahead of the next election, which is quite interesting. Um, so there's still quite a lot of uncertainty about uh, the next election result and where the various parties' popularity will be. Nevertheless, it seems pretty uh, safe to assume that Fidesz will be a large party uh, at the time of the next election, which means that um, reforms that weaken small parties, such as the introduction of plurality in single-member districts, would seem clearly to advantage Fidesz. Um, there's also at present no obvious reason to think that Fidesz won't be the largest party uh, at the next election, uh, which suggests that reforms that e exaggerate the bonus of the largest party are also likely to benefit Fidesz at the next election. There is, of course, uncertainty about that, um, and that is entirely compatible with what Fidesz has done, namely, it's introduced a small change in, in terms of the overall majoritarian character of the system, but it hasn't, certainly hasn't pushed the system as far as it could have gone. It hasn't moved to a pure single-member district system, for example, which would have been much riskier from Fidesz's point of view, given future electoral uncertainty. So again, this uh, aspect of the reform would seem to fit quite nicely with um, what we can currently see about Fidesz's interests. And then finally, um, the third part, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, I have a lovely graph that I forgot to tell you about. Um, sorry, yes, Fidesz's other argument um, in favor of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, so, uh, and another argument that a number of people from Fidesz introduced during the parliamentary debates and in other contexts has been that, well, um, some European countries have pure single-member district systems. We haven't introduced a pure single-member district system, so we must be more democratic than them if you're criticizing us for moving towards an excessively majoritarian direction. And these graphs merely illustrate that that argument... Um, ignores the importance of context when thinking about electoral systems. There is no perfect electoral system for all contexts. Uh, a given electoral system will work quite differently in different contexts. Um, so this compares, this looks at the sh seat share of largest party in the UK House of Commons and in the Hungarian Parliament looking at the total result in blue and the result only in the single member districts in red. You can see that, generally speaking, in the UK, the, the largest party gets between 50 and 60% of the seats. Sometimes it goes a little bit above, um, but never in the post-war era, era has it gone very much above. If you were to have a pure single-member district system in Hungary, by contrast, then there would be at least some elections where one party almost sweeps the board. So in the UK, um, there is a deeply entrenched party system and there's quite large variations in voting patterns between different parts of the country. So even when one of the parties is really unpopular, still it wins quite a large share of the seats. That is not the case in Hungary, and is not the case also in a variety of other polities that are more homogeneous um, uh, in, in their social composition. Um, so if you were to introduce a pure single member district system in Hungary, it wouldn't have the same effect as in uh, a country like the UK. Right, on to redistricting. Um, so the first thing to say here is that clearly redistricting was necessary because uh, the number of districts was being cut. In addition, redistricting was necessary anyway because there had been no redistricting since 1990. Um, and the disparities in the size of electorate between different uh, districts had become very large. There were four districts in 2010 with electorate under 30,000, and there were three with electorates over 70,000. So big disparities in electorate sizes. Um, <clears throat> sometimes you can justify such disparities in terms of um, region-specific needs or or very rural areas, this kind of thing. But there were no such just justifications uh, in the Hungarian case. <clears throat> so um, redistricting was clearly required. Uh, the redistricting that has been introduced, um, 
the, the first principle of it is that county boundaries cannot be uh, crossed uh, by any district. So districts must be contained within uh, counties, which means that the districting process is a two-step process. Firstly, you have apportionment, i.e. allocation, working out how many seats each county gets. And then you have districting, working out what are the actual precise boundaries between the districts within each of the counties. <clears throat> With regard to apportionment, uh, we can look at the criteria set out by the Venice Commission in its Code of Good Practice in Electoral Matters on how this should be done. <clears throat> the government was um, uh, very keen during the parliamentary debates on this to cite the Venice Commission rather often and say what we are doing fits with the guidelines of the Venice Commission. Let us see. Um, so the Venice Commission says that um, there should be equal voting power for all voters. Seats must be evenly distributed between the constituencies. And furthermore, it says that this uh, entails um, seats that are balanced on the basis of population or number of resident nationals or number of registered voters or popular, possibly those who actually vote in elections. <clears throat> Now, uh, what does the law say, the new Hungarian electoral law? Well, firstly, it says that um, districting, sorry, apportionment and districting are based on uh, the size of electorate, so the number of registered voters in each uh, district, um, which is a change from before. Uh, previously, it was the number of residents. Um, Lokoshag was the word used in the uh, uh, 1997 law and electoral procedure. <coughs> um, so that's a change. Um, this horrible graph, which none of you are going to be at the chart right, the table, which none of you are going to be able to see. Um, uh, firstly, what, what, the, what this one does is, um, it, so, what, what this is showing is the number of seats you allocate to the different counties under different ways of allocating seats. Um, these ones, th these three all allocate the seats <coughs> based on um, the size of the electorate, these all allocate the seats based on the size of the total population. Um, these are my estimates, by the way. I've done, the population ones are based on the 2011 population. Uh, the electorate ones are based on the electorate at the 2010 general election. Um, and you can see that there's actually very, di very little difference between the two. <laughs> you would be able to see if you could see the numbers, I promise. Um, if we just look at the, the, the leftmost column in each one, um, uh, the, so if we compare these population based figures with these electorate based figures then there are only a couple of differences Tolna gets one extra if you use the electorate based version and somewhere else Chongrad, Chongrad gets one fewer using the electorate based version um, <coughs> so these are very small differences now a cynic might point out that uh, Fides got above its average share of the vote in Tona and below in Jongrad, and therefore choosing this version rather than this version is good for Fidesz. This seems to me far too tenuous. Uh, it's a really small difference. Um, uh, it, 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 I, don't, I don't think that's significant. Um, so it doesn't seem to me that there's any reason to be worried about the shift to an electorate-based uh, calculation. Um, what the law doesn't say is what method is used for working out the allocation based on the electorate data. And there are a range of different methods that might be used. And what the various columns here do are show a number of the most commonly used methods. Um, again, you can see that the differences between these are pretty small. Um, uh, and essentially, the, the, the allocation that actually takes place is very close to my estimates of what would happen if you used saint Lagu. Uh, there are a couple of differences here. I'm not sure why there are a couple of differences, if maybe uh, they use 2011 electric figures rather than 2010. I'm not sure. If anyone knows, do let me know. Um, but anyway, uh, the actual figures are pretty close to saint Lagu, um, and it is basically now universally recognized among election system experts that saint Lagu is the best method to use. It's the most proportional way of apportioning seats to uh, uh, areas. Um, there are again a couple of devi uh, deviations, but nothing significant. 
um, if, if you look at what could have, uh, what, what apportionment could have come out had not been used rather than saint Lagu, um, then again you find a number of differences that seem to be favourable to Fides. Again, however, they're too small and it seems to me that uh, Fides has chosen the best method um, for apportioning uh, seats to counties here. So, um, basically the message of all of that is in terms of apportionment, things seem fine. The only problem is the law doesn't say what method is used and that is a problem. Um, then we move on to um, how do you actually draw up the boundaries within each county. The Venice Commission says, firstly on this, uh, that the permissible departure from the norm should not be more than 10% and should certainly not exceed 15% except in special circumstances. The law in Hungary, uh, introduced in December, says no district shall deviate by more than 15% from the national average, uh, except if this is necessary to preserve the rule that you don't cross county boundaries. So that rule is just within the terms specified by the Venice Commission. Um, but then there's another rule that says if the deviation from the average exceeds 20%, then Parliament will change the boundaries, which raises the question of what's the status of the first rule? about 15% if Parliament doesn't actually do anything until the deviation reaches 20%. And furthermore, will Parliament do anything when the deviation actually hits 20%? The districts that have been devised are protected by the two-thirds rule. And this applies to the whole electoral law, including the appendix that defines the districts. Um, so Parliament can only change these districts with a two-thirds majority. Um, is that going to happen? Uh, uh, it would be very difficult uh, um, to achieve that. So what actually happens if there is a deviation of more than 20% isn't actually at all clear. The law says that something should, something should happen, but there's no clear mechanism by which that would be forced, um, which again is a problem. The Venice Commission goes on to say that um, where redistricting takes place, this must be done impartially, without detriment to national minorities, taking account of the opinion of a committee, the majority of whose members are independent. Um, there is no committee in Hungary. Um, there is no independent committee. Um, the, the boundaries simply emerged out of the government by some means that I certainly don't understand. If anyone else does, great, um, but I certainly don't understand. Um, so this is, this is completely violated um, by uh, the approach that has been adopted here. Um, there's just nothing in the law that uh, addresses this. Um, and indeed, if again we trust the Hosea Holodash figures, then the districts that have been actually that have actually been produced, sorry, um, uh, those in which Fidesz is stronger are smaller than those in which the MSP is stronger, um, which suggests that there may have been an attempt to uh, manipulate the system uh, in Fidesz's direction. Even if that weren't the case, however, even if, if those calculations are wrong, then. The, the, the key point seems, seems to me to be that um, uh, there is not a process set down in this law uh, which fits the sorts of norms that the Venice Commission argues are vital. Um, so again, this seems to me a serious problem. Um, by contrast, if we look at this from the perspective of Fidesz leaders, it's not clear to me why, why they would want to introduce such, such a non-transparent system unless they were trying through this process to protect their own interests. Uh, so this is a matter of concern. Overall then, the reduction in the assembly size might seem to promote the public interest, but in actual fact this is not clear. It's not clear that we should care that much about these things whereas the weakening of the accountability of government, weakening of small parties, seems to me more important. Um, with regard to the shift towards majoritarianism, um, um, it's, I, I haven't seen a clear justification for that shift. 
whereas it does seem to uh, protect Fidesz's interests. And with regard to districting, the process that has been adopted uh, seems to me simply indefensible. Um, while uh, if it's the case that Fidesz has skewed the boundaries in its favour and has locked them in behind a two-thirds rule, then that would be very worrying. So overall, this looks like an electoral reform of the type that I've referred to in the book that Gabor talked about at the start as uh, elite majority imposition. The majority in power in politics have, have uh, imposed a system um, that uh, serves their own purposes. At the same time, um, the government does seem to have operated subject to at least some normative constraints in doing this. Um, Fidesz did not push majoritarianism to the extreme. Uh, as I suggested, that may partly reflect its own interest, given uncertainty in future election results. Um, but Fidesz could certainly have been harder on small parties than it was. I mean, in theory, it could have been harder on small parties. It could have raised the threshold on getting into Parliament, but it didn't choose to do so. Um, it did not skew the apportionment uh, system uh, in its favour. And two other things didn't happen. Um, there was the early proposal, as, as many of you will be aware, or the suggestion, that parents might be given extra votes uh, for their children. That did not happen. Um, and my understanding, at least, is that one reason it did not happen was that the consultation, public consultation yielded some pretty negative thoughts on that subject. Um, and <coughs> further... Um, Interesting story about signature requirements for <coughs> candidacy uh, in the single member districts. The government initially proposed to raise the number of signatures that you require to gather in order to be a candidate from 750 to 1,500. It said, we're roughly cutting the, the number of districts by half, so we should double the number of signatures. Of course, they weren't cutting the number of districts by half, they were cutting the number of districts by 40% uh, only. So the effect of this change would have been in to increase the proportion of voters in the average district, average district required uh, to um, nominate a candidate from 1.6% to 2%. But the government backed down on this. They backed down. Um, and in fact, they raised the threshold only to 1,000, which actually reduced the uh, proportion of local voters required from 1.6% to 1.3%. Um, they did this in the final stages of the passage of the bill through Parliament. Why did they do this? I, I, can't, I can't see any interest in Fidesz uh, uh, in, in making this change. Um, your thoughts would be welcome. So, um, overall we have uh, a reform that seems geared towards Fidesz's interests, but within some constraints. Um, how does this compare with electoral reforms passed elsewhere? Uh, um, well, this chart um, shows us basically an overall pattern. Uh, I fear I'm going to have to go through this a bit quickly, so uh, <laughs> I will try to hurry up. Essentially, this, this shows three different types of electoral reform process. Um, and it looks at all processes of electoral reform in democratic countries in Europe since 1945. Um, uh, the processes are the elite majority imposition type that I've already talked about, where the politicians in power uh, change the system uh, to their own advantage. Um, secondly, elite bargains and elite settlements, where politicians across the political spectrum get together and agree a reform, either uh, a reform that they think will be good for everyone together in an elite settlement or an, in an elite bargain, basically a reform that is composed of various bits and pieces that individual parties like individually. And then finally, you have reforms by elite mass interaction, as I call it, um, where both the politicians and public opinion are very important in shaping the reform processes. Um, now, there are lots of red cases, cases of elite bargains and elite settlements, but these overwhelmingly come during democratization processes. Um, if we're looking at reforms in established democracies, um, then primarily we're looking at elite majority impositions <coughs> and elite mass interactions. The elite mass interactions only come in uh, in very recent years. So basically what this picture tells you is that Hungary is not alone. <laughs> there are lots of cases of elite majority imposition. 
There are 26 on the graph here across European countries since 1945. Um, so it is not, a, not particularly unusual for, for parties, uh, for governments to do this kind of thing. Um, I can tell you about lots of exciting examples um, of particularly extreme uh, manipulations of electoral systems by parties um, in the 1950s, for example, in uh, France and Greece, electoral systems were introduced where there were different systems in different parts of the country, depending on how strong the government was in different parts of the country. So they introduced majoritarian systems in the parts of the country where the government was strong. They introduced proportional systems in the parts of the country where the government was weak in order to um, maximize their gains. Um, uh, more recently, um, in, again, France and Greece uh, in the 1980s, Mitterrand and Papandreou both saw that they were going to lose the forthcoming elections, so they moved to proportional electoral systems and more proportional electoral systems um, uh, in order to limit their losses. Um, and if we think about redistricting, which is an important part of this story, um, again, <coughs> France needs to be a case that we look at. Um, in France, I mean, the, the, the rules in France are, are worse than those that have been introduced in Hungary. Um, there is, as in Hungary, no independent commission. Uh, redistricting is always controlled by the executive. There have been only three redistricting exercises in 1958, in 1986, and since 2007. And in each of these, the bias in favor of the governing parties has been very, very great. <clears throat> so, Hungary is not alone uh, in this story. Um, if I'm allowed five more minutes on uh, uh, <coughs> the third part of this, which is on, okay, so we found that we um, have uh, electoral reforms, quite a lot of electoral reforms, including in Hungary, where um, the interests of the politicians in power, in power seem to dominate the choice of the electoral system. Um, what are the conditions in which that might not be the case? What are the conditions in which pu the public interest might come more to the fore? <clears throat> and as I've said, there are some cases of what I've called elite mass interaction, um, where public disaffection with politics of various different types drives the electoral reform process. These can involve an active pu public push, as in uh, New Zealand and Italy in the 1990s, or... Um, a more um, passive public influence where, where politicians perceive there's a pop popular disengagement with politics and want to reach out to voters with something that will appeal. Um, and particularly interesting are a range of reforms through which politicians in Austria, Belgium, the Netherlands, Sweden, Iceland, Estonia, Lithuania, Romania <coughs> have introduced elements to electoral systems that increase the personalization of those systems, that increase voters' capacity to choose among individual candidates rather than just political parties in order to try to reconnect with voters. <coughs> so um, these sorts of reforms do exist. Um, there's evidence that they're becoming more frequent. On the other hand, um, it is often the case that the reforms that are introduced are largely symbolic. They don't really have very much effect. Or the reforms that are introduced are the ones that politicians aren't very frightened of um, and don't much affect their interests. And also, of course, we need to ask the question, well, do voters actually understand their own interests? So is that kind of reform process any better than one that is dominated by politicians? <clears throat> um, and then there are the reforms. So, 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 so that means that... Um, um, there, there are possible ways by which public pressure can come up and, and force politicians to do something if um, there is enough public engagement and if there are some politicians who are willing to, to push on the issue and, and say, we are going to change the system in order to reflect public concerns. If, however, we're talking about the, the blue bars, the cases of elite majority imposition, here the question is, to what degree are politicians constrained by considerations of legitimacy, by normative notions of what is acceptable? And here it's clear that history is the major factor. <coughs> um, where an electoral system has been subject to manipulation in the past, the barriers to manipulating it again are, are lower. People kind of think, well, that's just what politicians do. So the fact that France and Greece in particular keep on abusing the electoral system again and again and again uh, clearly reflects that. 
Um, in addition, once norms emerge, they may become pretty difficult to shift. Um, New Zealand is an interesting case here. In New Zealand, you have um, quite a low tolerance for deviations in the size of districts. So districts are allowed to deviate from the national average by only 5%, which is unusually small in international comparison. And this has existed for quite a long time. Um, it dates from the time when New Zealand had a simple plurality, first past the post, electoral system. Now New Zealand has a mixed system, in which case, in, in which it doesn't actually matter really whether the districts are the same size as each other for the overall composition of parliament, because the composition of parliament is determined overall by the proportional part of the system rather than by the single member districts. Um, but nevertheless, they've kept this tolerance. They've talked about changing it quite a lot, and many people have said, said, to, him, it would be, said to them, it would be much better to um, uh, increase the tolerance of deviation. Um, but politicians have been frightened of doing so because they fear looking as though they're diluting the democratic character of the system. Um, similarly, in New Zealand, uh, sorry, in, in the United States, there's basically a weird combination of, on the one hand, zero tolerance for deviations in, um, in the, the number of, the size of the population in different districts. So all districts have to be exactly the same size within any state. Um, but at the same time, there's pretty extreme gerrymandering. So actually how you draw the district boundaries um, is subject to a lot of uh, political manipulation. Um, and th that is seen as acceptable reflects the fact that norms have developed whereby um, um, districts must, must be the same size. This is a really fundamental norm, but uh, gerrymandering is perceived as acceptable. In the Hungarian case, there was very little uh, history of uh, manipulation of the electoral system. Um, to go on, but there was also um, a lack of kind of strong embedded norms um, that would protect against um, uh, the sorts of manipulations that we have seen. In particular, we should be equally critical of previous governments, particularly the, the 94 to 98 government, which passed the previous law on uh, electoral um, procedure. Thank you. Um, which uh, failed to instigate proper uh, mechanisms for uh, uh, drawing up districts. But norms all also change over time. <clears throat> um, and it's important to think about how they can change over time. There's at least some evidence of uh, a long-term pattern of evolution towards more constraining norms shaping the sorts of uh, electoral reforms that can be introduced. The kinds of manipulation seen in the 1950s are of a different magnitude from the sorts of manipulation that we see today. That notion of having two different electoral systems in different parts of the country. Um, we certainly don't have any instances of that post-1950s. Um, uh, whether, whether it would be possible, and we can't of course be sure, but we certainly don't have any cases. And it's at least plausible to argue that um, in the 1950s, such reforms could be justified on the basis that they were needed in order to keep out anti-system, anti-democratic forces. Whereas today, where such forces are weaker, you don't have such a justification. And furthermore, <coughs> um, whereas in the past, um, most voters, or more voters, were partisans, um, and, in, and in that kind of situation, um, you would expect... Um, uh, a party uh, reforming the electoral system for its own purposes uh, not to suffer uh, uh, punishment at the ballot box. I mean, essentially, if, if, if the, the people who supported that party would think that such reform was acceptable, the people who opposed that party would think it was unacceptable but weren't going to vote for it anyway. So you don't get a cost. You, you're, politicians aren't punished in that environment for manipulating the electoral system. In a world of catch-all parties with skeptical floating voters, you would expect such manipulations to make more of a difference. You would expect politicians to be more likely to be punished by voters for engaging in such manipulation. There was going to be a bit more, but I shall skip over it. I won't get the chance to talk about redistricting in the UK, alas. Um, but I shall draw out a few very quick conclusions um, from all of this. Firstly, 
Um, Hungar Hungary's reform um, appears to have been designed primarily to serve the interests of Fidesz leaders, though uh, there are some clear normative constraints as well. Um, secondly, this is not an, an, an unusual thing, but at the same time, that is not an excuse for manipulating the system. Um, thirdly, if we're thinking about um, what can happen in the future, public pressure can uh, force change, but it can only do so if politicians seize the issue and decide that they are going to uh, uh, um, introduce uh, reforms that appeal more to the public mood. And finally, I didn't quite get onto this, uh, but um, norms appear to become more, uh, sorry, I got into the first part of this, norms appear to be becoming more constraining over time. However, they do so in ways that are very sticky and unpredictable. They seem to, seem to change in some countries, but not in other countries. It's not clear why. Um, so whether Hungary can expect a more uh, 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 norm-respecting future with regard to its electoral system, who knows? I'll stop there. I'm more than delighted that I can be here. Uh, I promise I uh, won't uh, waste your time so long I can see that you are getting tired. I cannot understand why because uh, this is the, I can't imagine there is anything can be more excited or interesting than the process of the mandate allocation. Uh, I just have a few, uh, three or four uh, short comments that can be uh, questions too. So if you feel, uh, you, feel you feel like, uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Uh, I uh, just, you mentioned the, that it, it was the, one of the most difficult uh, electoral system in the whole wide world. And uh, do, do you feel that we succeeded to make an, uh, uh, a more, more simple one? I don't think so, because uh, I'm not sure whether you know this um, uh, story that when in 1990 uh, at the first Hungarian uh, parliament elections uh, from the US some observers uh, came to here and uh, tried to understand the mandate allocation process about the surplus votes and everything. And uh, they, they failed to understand it, and they, they just said one thing. I failed to understand the, the mandate allocation system, but now I understand why it was a Hungarian who invented the Rubik's Cube. <laughs> so uh, I, I think this is a big problem because there was no real uh, reason to make a new Hungarian electoral system. That, that it wasn't a constitutional force. Of course, we, we should have amended it, uh, a few times, and now we should do uh, f a few uh, mod modifications concerning the, the, the nomination process or the, the constituency uh, problems, uh, but we do not need uh, a new electoral system. Uh, there is only one, uh, one reason uh, which, which makes uh, really justified uh, uh, to make a new uh, electoral system. It is because it is very, very difficult and nobody understands a word from it. And, and I think it, it, it is a real legitimacy problem. So uh, when we knew that uh, Fidesz gained a two-thirds majority in parliament, uh, it, it was absolutely sure that they will reduce the number of the MPs. And if they reduce the number of the MPs, it will be uh, uh, unavoidable to make a new uh, electoral system. And, and I really hope that if they do it, it will be more simple, more easy to understand. Uh, this is what, uh, what, what did not happen, uh, I, I think. What do you think about this? Uh, well, I mentioned a couple of simplifications in the talk, um, <coughs> which um, move in some direction towards greater simplicity. Uh, I mean, I, I, it, it is still an unusually complicated electoral system. <laughs> uh, that is certainly the case. Um, uh, but uh, I, mean, I guess my question to, be, to you would be, you, you, you mentioned there that uh, this, is, this is a severe legitimacy problem. And ha how severe is the legitimacy problem that derives specifically from the complexity of the system? It cannot be polled. It cannot be measured at all. What, what, what we know is that uh, mo most Hungarian people about, I uh, can't remember exactly, about 60 or 70 percent uh, admitted that I can understand uh, uh, single word from the whole electoral system. They go to vote, they, they uh, sign the, their X's, 
And after that, what happens to their vote? How they turn to be mandates? They have no clue. And, um, well, and the, U the UK has what in some ways might be regarded as the most simple electoral system. Single member districts, plurality, straight. Uh, there are polls suggesting that in the UK the majority of voters think that in order to win a seat you need to have a majority, over 50% of the votes in the district, which is false. Yeah. So, um, you know, even in the very simplest electoral system, voters don't get it. Yeah, of, of course, they, they don't get the whole, whole process, but uh, in, uh, in Great Britain, they know that they have only one vote. They have just single member constituencies, so it's, it's very easy to understand. Uh, of course, they, they are not aware of all the items, um, but, but I, th I think it's uh, completely different in Hungary, where, where the, mo most people haven't got a clue, and, and they uh, do not pretend they do. So. Uh, I think it's a real threat. Um, uh, just remember what happened in 2002. Uh, there was absolutely no reason when uh, MIEPS and Fidesz politicians uh, announced that they were cheating about the electoral process. There was no reason why they said that. Uh, no evidence for that, but, but lo lots of uh, Fidesz and, uh, and most MIEPS politicians said that it, uh, the whole electoral process was cheated. And what happened? Uh, hundred thousands of people uh, believed it, and on 4th of July, uh, some of them occupied the Elizabeth Bridge. Uh, I, don't, I don't say that uh, it would, uh, would uh, it shouldn't happen if uh, we had more, a more simple uh, electoral system, but it's a factor. If they knew how, how the electoral system worked, uh, maybe they could not perceive uh, this kind of interpretation. But this, this is just one thing. I think the mo most uh, important question is that what was the main motive for Fidesz when changing the, uh, the electoral system? Uh, you mentioned, uh, I think, the mo most relevant uh, aspects. But uh, if we w want to assume uh, what, what was in their head uh, when, when uh, working on this project, and, and, and it took a long time, uh, so, so they think it very well. Uh, I think the most, the, uh, if, if you want to uh, uh, say it in one sentence, how to convert uh, our uh, relative advantage to absolute majority in the parliament? That was the question. Because they, they, they are aware of the fact that uh, they, they will not gain again uh, 53% uh, of votes in 2014. They know that they will have significant, significantly less votes. But if they can still be uh, the relative biggest party in Hungary, about 30%, still can gain uh, the absolute majority in parliament if the, the opposition is fragmented enough. So uh, I think th this was their uh, main motive, how to win an election with only 30, 35% of votes. And this electoral system makes it possible uh, to, to keep the absolute majority, not the two-thirds majority, but the absolute majority can be, uh, uh, can be gained again only with a 30 or 35 percent of votes. Uh, let me emphasize, in case the opposition is fragmented. And this is what um, determined the whole uh, electoral process. This is why you mentioned the, the nomination process, that there was an idea that, that they will uh, emerge the number of signatures to 1,500. And finally, they, they decided only uh, to 1,000, uh, which is uh, absolutely uh, uh, make it more simple for a candidate to, to run, run for, 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 the, for the mandate. And uh, why, this, why this happened? I don't think it's, it's because uh, Fidesz um, were generous uh, or something. Uh, it just happened because it's easier to win in a single member constituency if you have not just one or two uh, uh, nominees at, at the single member uh, constituency, but if you have five, six, or seven, you can, you can uh, have victory even with 25% of votes. So this is why, uh, uh, according to my opinion, they, they made the, the conditions of the nomination uh, much easier than before. Do you agree with that? <laughs> I, I have no idea. It sounds like a very plausible argument, yes. yes. Okay, uh, uh, just let me ask one, one question uh, uh, because of the uh, in international uh, level. 
uh, you, you just uh, m mentioned with a few words the suffrage for the Hungarians uh, living abroad. And uh, there will be, maybe there will be a, a big problem and uh, experts are uh, discussing about it and, and they do not agree uh, that uh, uh, out of country votes are only coming to the national list and they don't have the uh, chance to vote for a single member uh, candidate. So uh, is it against the principle of equal law? Do you know anywhere in the whole world uh, some, uh, a solution like this, that people living in a country have two votes and living, people living out of the country only one? I think it can be very embarrassing in Strasbourg if somebody goes there. Yeah, um, I, I haven't surveyed, so I've, I've been doing a big survey of aspects of electoral systems across lots of countries, of which a lot of these comparisons were based on, and I haven't been including franchise issues in that, so I can't be 100% confident, um, but certainly no, I am not aware of any other cases that uh, uh, have that kind of unequal uh, franchise. I mean, another interesting point of comparison there is to look at... Um, what countries uh, um, impose limits on how long you can be out of a country for before you lose your vote. Um, you know, in the vast majority of countries that allow votes to people who live, uh, live outside the country, that operates only for a limited period of time. Uh, I mean, in the UK, I think you're allowed 20 years out of the country, and after that, you lose your vote. Um, so, and so, you know, that, that's another aspect of this. Yes of the reform that is unusual here. Yeah, as far as I know, in, in Europe there is no country where uh, the, the people living in the country has two votes and out, out of country just uh, only one. Yeah. Uh, we will see, uh, most of the politicians uh, said, that, uh, said that, yeah, we know it's a problem, May, maybe it can cause co constitutional problems. I don't, I don't feel that uh, this constitutional court uh, will go against this electoral law. Uh, I, I'm just afraid that it, uh, it, it will go to Strasbourg, but it can happen only after 2014, after the first election uh, held according to this new law. Uh, and, and I think there is one more uh, dimension, uh, that there is, a, there is a threat that in 2013, if uh, Fidesz takes a look at the new uh, public opinion polls, maybe they will make an absolutely new uh, electoral system, so we are now talking about something which maybe will not, will not be in force uh, in, in 2014. Now we are laughing at, laughing at that, but uh, just remember that in 2010, in May, uh, after winning the elections, uh, Fidesz uh, handed in uh, the, uh, an absolutely new elect electoral uh, act, uh, which did not go through the, the parliament, but for more than a year, it was the official, po uh, official point of view of Fidesz, which uh, would have made uh, the, the electoral system much more uh, proportional than this one. And uh, we, we were uh, discussing about it for, for a year, and now we can see a completely different one. And uh, I'm not really sure that in 2014 we will vote uh, by this one. That's, that, that's the most pessimistic ver uh, version. Great, thank you. Um, on that last uh, point, uh, the, um, the countries where this works very well are New Zealand, Australia, and Canada. Um, now, clearly, these are all countries with long traditions of independent bureaucracy and, and th th that work very well. Um, <clears throat> and Canada moved from a system uh, in which um, party nominees were in charge, essentially, of the, the process only in the 1950s and the 1960s um, in, in the different provinces and the, and the federal level at different times. Um, <coughs> uh, so it's a fairly recent development in Canada, but you're quite right that it is, it is embedded within a system in which bureaucratic independence uh, is strong. Um, none of these countries are countries that have had that independent uh, bureaucracy since time immemorial. You know, they, they, they have all experienced change over time, but it is a very, very gradual process of change. What about the Mexican electoral uh, commission, which is famous for being an exceptionally independent-minded and uh, professional body in a... Mexico? Yeah. I'm afraid... 
Fred Gabriel, you know more about the Mexican Electoral Commission than I do. <laughs> 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 Uh, I, I think we, we should start somewhere. It's very hard to find, of course, um, objective and not non-biased uh, people in, in the whole country. Uh, but I, I think we have to start, start some, somewhere. Now we could see that what, what happens to the uh, constituency map if, uh, if uh, an, an unknown group uh, draws the, the boundaries. Don't know who are they, don't know when did they do it, where did they do it, and, and why. Of course, we do know, but we, we, don't, we don't know it uh, exactly. Uh, so uh, this is what happens when uh, the whole uh, boundary uh, question is uh, solved in a, in a very small group. And uh, we have to try uh, to, to make, an, make a, a, a kind of boundary commission like uh, it, it works in, in Great Britain. I'm, I'm sure that it will not be perfect in, in the f first periods of times, but after decades, maybe we can create the tradition and, uh, and uh, exclude somehow gen German ring. Uh, of course, uh, where, uh, in every country where there are uh, constituencies, there is always German ring. Uh, what differs is the, 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 the amount of it. Now it, it is a completely gerrymandered map, which was drawn by a very small group. If we had a, 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 a group uh, who, who, who contains uh, people from the statistic office, from the electoral office, and some politicians also sit in, there will there also be a, a political motivation in, in, in the group, but, but uh, the the weight of it uh, can be reduced time after time. We have to start sometime. Uh, we, uh, we uh, in political since 2007, we recommend that we, we should make uh, uh, an, an institution that is similar to the boundary commissions in, in Great Britain. Uh, this is what the Venice Commission uh, also recommended. Now we see uh, this, this kind of uh, um, institution we have to wait for them for a few more uh, years. Yeah, and the difficulty, of course, it relates to what I was saying towards the end of the talk, namely that there are some trajectories in which norms sort of move in the right direction and gradually you get, you get a process by which um, a, a more independent, impartial process emerges. And there are other cases in which you don't. And I am aware of no understanding in political science of why you get one sort of process in some cases and another sort of process in other cases. <laughs> I just uh, wanted to react. I have a question on the yeah, procedure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, about the, the signatures. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it, it's the other uh, great problem with the Hungarian electoral system that the political corruption is related to these so-called um, nomination slips, or I don't know how you call it. Uh, which is a shame that uh, this new government uh, did not uh, exclude it. Of course, I did not count on, uh, did not count on it that they would do it, but uh, it, it is still a shame that uh, the Hungarian democracy cannot rid of this uh, kind of political uh, corruption. But it's a fact that uh, it will be much easier to collect these uh, signatures. So in the black market, maybe the price of the, of the nomination slips will be much reduced. And not, not only because of the 1,000 uh, necessary nomination slips for one candidate, uh, but uh, because of the, the exclusion of the county list. Uh, it's a very important uh, modification in the new electoral system because earlier you had uh, to have at least two candidates in every single county eight in Budapest, four in Pest, and uh, three in Warsaw, for example, and all 17 other counties, you, need, you needed at least two candidates uh, in order to have a county list, which means uh, that you needed uh, 36,750 signatures divided in all country in order to have a party list in every single town of the, uh, every single village of the, of the country. Now 27,000 is enough, and uh, it's, uh, it's enough to collect them in only nine counties and in Budapest. This is a very, very, very big uh, simplification. 
and, and, and I think they did not think it over uh, absolutely in Fidesz because it's, it's uh, too, too generous uh, to the, uh, to the uh, enemies. So don't talk about <laughs> uh, actually, I did, and, <laughs> and Ma Magyar Nemzet some, sometimes quotes it. Uh, la last week they did it, did it again, so uh, I'm afraid that in the uh, electoral procedure uh, law, uh, there, there will be a few, uh, few, few, yeah, which, which makes it a little bit harder to collect. Actually, now we don't know how many days. Uh, uh, for, for, the co for the collection period. Earlier we had 36 days. Uh, Other Janos mentioned it, it will be reduced, of course. Uh, they tried to reduce it uh, at the local elections to nine days. Yes. Finally, they were very generous and, uh, and, and they gave, I think, 16, 16 days. Uh, Other Janos in July 2011 mentioned that uh, 21 days will be enough. I'm really curious uh, what, what will show up in the uh, law for electoral procedure. Yeah, there was a question by Alan that why uh, MPs vote for restricting the number of parliament, such a huge cut, which is unprecedented. I think they were motivated by, by the Prime Minister to do so because they fully changed the, the self-government system of the country. So there will be government offices everywhere and the reintroduction of Yarash that is a small units, which will be like exactly like the electoral district. So, so there will be in each electoral district a, a representative, an officer of the government. So that is a more sort of sociological uh, instrument to control the constituency in some ways. And those MPs who must leave the parliament will get a position in local government offices. I think that's, that's the carrot and the stick uh, game of this. Majors, uh, the, the mayors cannot be uh, MPs anymore after yes. 2014. This is the other. Yes. I mean, it relates to the point that you made about party discipline. That yeah. uh, I mean, e even if, if a, another job is being promised, you know, it, it's a promise. It's a different sort of job. You would kind of expect that quite a few people would think, "I'm quite happy working here in Parliament, actually," um, and uh, wouldn't want to accept that. Uh, it seems to me extraordinary the party discipline is at such a high level that even with that sort of carrot, uh, it's possible to get this through without dissent. In 2010... It stems, it stems from the fact of the change in the internal regulations of Fidesz in 2003 from Fidesz Civic Party was changed to Civic Association and then from that point Fidesz became a highly centralized party from inside so this is just the extension of the party rules to the, to the country yeah but you're absolutely right that uh, Viktor Orban uh, felt that this can be uh, a conflict between 
between the board leaders and the, and the members. And this is why it happened that in 2010, early January, February, or the end, at the end of the, uh, 2009, all MP candidates visited Viktor Orban at his Fairchild House. And the one thing uh, he said to everybody that I want to reduce the number of the uh, parliament. Maybe this is just a four-year four year term for you. And uh, can I continue uh, pushing the button when, when uh, reducing the number of the MPs? Yes. So the, it, was this, it, it was explicitly told to everybody. So he, he felt that this can be a problem uh, in the middle of the period. Uh, he was prepared for it, and he succeeded. Okay. Then, uh